So the first thing I want to do, like I said, is to draw ourselves some cells. So here we have our nodal cell. Um, your book illustrates the nodal cells as being orange or yellow. And that's the same color that your book uses to represent neurons and nerves. And I don't like that illustration choice because it gives students the impression that nodal cells are neurons of some kind. And they're not. Nodal cells are cardiac muscle cells, just like the rest of the myocardium. They are simply specialized ones. And I can prove this to you by going into histology guide and showing you the histological difference between the two. Um, the nodal cells tend to stain a little bit lighter due to some special adaptations they have for doing their specific job. Um, but if you look at them on histology guide, in spite of those adaptations and the fact that you can see the difference a little bit, they're still striated muscle. So that's thing number one to know is that they're not neurons and they're not some kind of special magical different thing. They are modified cardiac muscle cells that just have special features and properties. And so are the conducting cells. So a node is a place where there's lots of those cells in a group. And the conducting cells are basically sort of pathways or wires made of those same kind of cells. So let's draw the features just so we have all of our parts and ducts in a row. And I'll label this as well. Still cardiac muscle, just fancy. So if it's still cardiac muscle, that means it has to have the same features. So we've got our nucleus here. And remember, cardiac muscle cells are uninucleate. So unlike skeletal muscle, they only have one nucleus, not a bunch. They do have a bunch of mitochondria though, because if you are constantly pumping throughout the life of an individual, then a lot of power sources are necessary. And because they are also cardiac muscle cells, and that is striated, They have sarcomeres. So I'm just gonna draw, uh, draw us a reference sarcomere right here. I'm not gonna fill the whole cell with it because that would take 80 years to draw, but you get the idea. So here we've got our thick filaments with our M line and all that good stuff. And then I'll just make the thin filaments be green because that's the color I chose. And then I'll make our Z line slash disc. Boop, 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 boop. Okay.
well, that's a mitochondrion, you get the idea. Okay, so, so far this has no differences from a contractile cell. So now we have to add those things in. And so the main difference is at the membrane. Which means I gotta move this over here. So I'm going to zoom in on my membrane. So if I were to zoom in my, on my membrane, the thing that is making it different, I have my little membrane here. Oops, wrong way. And I'm gonna make a little color-coded chart here. And I'm gonna be a little bit reductive just because I don't have a whole lot of space. So these are going to be leak channels. So when I said I was going to be reductive, what I mean is I'm just kind of lumping all the voltage gated channels into one color for this drawing because I don't have sufficient room to draw each kind. But that doesn't mean that they're all the same. So I'm just letting you know that for the drawing purposes. And then orange is going to be our friend sodium potassium pump. Okay, let the drawing commence. So, need to have some of these. So it's a very, very leaky membrane. So with my tiny, tiny line, let's draw some ions and show they're leaking. So this is in, this is out. So our sodium potassium pump is going to kick out three sodium, gather up two potassium. But then that sodium can leak back through the leak channels. And to some extent, the potassium can also leak. But mostly it's the sodium and calcium, a little bit of that too. And then the voltage gated channels are of course only going to be open when we're actively depolarizing. So they're not open right now. So the difference here is Membrane is very leaky. But other than that, it's got the same anatomy. So branching cell structure, uninucleate, striated muscle cell, lots of mitochondria. The membrane is the difference. Lots and lots of leak channels facilitate this constant drift 
towards threshold and let's draw that too. Just down here to remind ourselves what this potential looks like. And then we will erase this and move on to a zoomed out view where we'll start to discuss the nodal system as a whole. But the kind of potential that this cell makes, I think it's good to draw. So where red is threshold. So the leak channels are just constantly causing this membrane to drift back towards threshold and depolarize repeatedly. And that is what gives the cell the attribute that we call automaticity. And let's write that too. Okay, so that's what the cells look like and are doing. So now let's draw them in groups in the context of a whole heart. And we'll have a look at what they're doing there. Oh, which reminds me of a, of a grave error I've made in this picture. I omitted the gap junctions and I should not have done that. So let's label those. And briefly, briefly, I'll discuss who their neighbors could be. And so perhaps the neighbor of this nodal cell is not another nodal cell, but it's a contractile cell, which I'll draw in a different color. And if that's the case, then when this nodal cell depolarizes, as is pictured in the bottom left, the ion flux that results from that is going to flow over to the neighboring cell and excite that cell too. So if this guy's neighbor is a contractile cell, that would suggest that this nodal cell is like at the edge of a node or it's one of the Purkinje fiber ones. Um, so within a node, lots of the nodal cells will be connected to each other, but then at the edge, they'll be connected via gap junctions to neighboring non-nodal cells. So I'm just gonna write in here. There we go. So the way that the excitation spreads from the nodal cells to the contractile cells is just they're physically connected and they're cytoplasms are connected via gap junctions. Okay. So now let's look at one level of complexity zoomed out. And we will build up the concept of the nodal system. And so to do this, I have to draw again, a heart from memory. So let's see how that goes. And again, I'm not gonna draw the great vessels because they're not important for this. I don't need to draw the great vessels to communicate about the electrical events of the heart. So that will be an obvious omission as I draw. I'm saying that both for your benefit, but also for the benefit of future watchers of this who might be wondering why there is no nodal system pictured in this, and that's because I don't need it. So just leave me alone, man. We all know that it's there. All of the great vessels are there, but it's not important for this. So I'm just drawing the chambers 
and more importantly, the myocardium. And I'm actually going to make the intraventricular septum beefier than I need to because I need room to draw stuff in there. Okay. And then got a really robust left ventricular wall. And then not quite as robust on our right side because it doesn't need to be. Okay. So let me just color this in because I'll need it to be colored in to have the drawings I'm going to make inside of it be easy to look at. And then we'll go ahead and label our chambers because labeling is important. We've got to label all the stuff. There, that's decent. Okay. So we got our atria right and left. And then I'll actually make this arrow. There, go to the edge here because I want to draw the Purkinje fibers at some point. And then that middle strip is going to be the interventricular septum. I'll label that at the end. So now I'm going to choose not yellow to illustrate the nodal system because I already said I don't like why that your book does that. Um, so I will make it the green. Yes. Cool. Okay. So let me draw my Purkinje fibers. All right. And we're good. So I will label these guys in green so that their labels match. This one has an, a lot of names. It's one of those annoying ones. So you can call it the atrio ventricular bundle or the bundle of his, which is a, a, a guy's last name. Um, so like many things, there's the anatomical and functional name that describes the thing. And then there's the name for the guy who discovered it and was like, aha, it's, I can name it after me now. So you may pick either one. Um, I'm just telling you that there's both so that, you know, you don't look at one term and not recognize it. And then these guys in the interventricular septum are, are bundle branches. And then Purkinje fibers are named after Purkinje, who is one of the earliest neuroanatomists and gave us all kinds of wonderful drawings of various electrical cells, including these, but not limited to them. Okay, so now we have our nodal system. And what I'm gonna do on the right-hand side of the screen is describe the order in which they go. So at the start of each cardiac cycle, sinoatrial node depolarizes. And so that's, remember, 
due to the leak channels, it's drifting to threshold and it gets to threshold by itself and then it depolarizes all on its lonesome. So one of those peaks of that graph I showed you is what's happening first. And remember, since the nodal system is connected to other nodal cells by gap junctions and also to the surrounding myocardium via gap junctions, the depolarization easily spreads. So here's what I'm gonna do that's different from the book illustration is I'm going to first write all of the nodal events in green. And then between them, I'm going to write the corresponding muscular events because depolarization is followed by contraction. And since the whole point of the heart is to contract, to move blood around, including the contraction is important as well. So sinoatrial node depolarizes. And that impulse is what we'll call it. Oops, I ran out of room. There we go. So impulse proceeds through internodal pathway to AV node where there is a pause. And I'll explain the pause in a moment. The other thing I need to draw now is something that you can't see in this picture yet, but I'm gonna draw you a representation of it. And I'm gonna make that, no, let's make it blue. The valves that I've drawn here, they are not made of myocardium. They're not made of electrically excitable cells at all. They are part of the fibrous skeleton of the heart, which is made of collagen. I'm gonna draw it all the way across. And then I will label it. Including valves and it's made out of collagen. So that's significant and it's related to the pause because in the cardiac cycle, we want the atria to contract first, not at the same time as the ventricles, but before them. So filling in between the green events, I'm gonna add some pink events, which are the muscle actions. So, as a result of the SA node depolarizing, we get a wave of depolarization through the atria. Which is gonna move outward. And then following that wave of depolarization, we have contraction. So therefore, so the impulse proceeds through the internodal pathway during these waves to the AV node where we have this pause. And this pause is related to the time the atria need to finish systole.
before the ventricles begin to do their thing. So the reason I drew the fibrous skeleton of the heart here in service of that pause is because the fibrous skeleton of the heart is an electrical insulator. So you'll notice that it goes across the boundary between the atria and the ventricles completely. So it blocks the Purkinje fibers from coming up into the atria. That's not where they are. And the bundle of Hiss must pass through it to get down to the rest of the heart. So the reason that's significant is I already told you that cardiac muscle cells are joined to each other by gap junctions. So it's, if that's true, then what's to stop the impulse from the SA node from rapidly descending throughout the whole heart via those gap junctions and causing the whole entire heart to contract basically at the same time? That wouldn't work because it wouldn't leave enough time for the atria to finish before the ventricles would go. So if that was the case, we would have no ordered contraction. It would just all kind of squeeze. So if we want this order, we've got to do something to divide the chambers. And so that's what the fibrous skeleton is partially for. It electrically isolates the top from the bottom, the atria from the ventricles, which is pretty nifty. Okay, so that's awesome. Got to pick back up where we are left off with this. So that delay allows enough time. And then after that, not very long after. The impulse proceeds down the bundle of Hiss and into the bundle branches. And so during that time, shortly after it rather, the traveling wave of depolarization is going to descend down the interventricular septum. And then once it, reached the, it reaches the apex, and I'm gonna move these so I can write this. I'll, re, I'll rewrite them momentarily. I'm just gonna label them at a different location. There we go, now I have room. So four at the apex. The impulse turns around and travels up the Purkinje fibers. And after that, ventricles depolarize and contract from apex up. And that from apex up aspect is really important because that's how you efficiently squeeze blood up and out of the heart, like squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. And the reason that 
we efficiently squeeze blood up and out is because of the nodal pathway and its order and the way that it proceeds down and then turns around. And also because of course, the electrical isolation provided by the fibrous skeleton prevents any of that from occurring until the atria are finished depolarizing and contracting. So, some stuff to remember before I move on to the next portion of this is, let's just do ourselves a little reminder list. So let's remind ourselves, contraction follows depolarization. Not very, very long, it's an order of milliseconds, but there is a little bit of time between the two things, which is why I included the pink steps between the green ones. And this allows, of course, the correct order of other events to proceed. And then let's also remind ourselves The fibrous skeleton is an electrical insulator, meaning it prevents transmission of electrical signals from the atria to the ventricles. Okay, and then one thing I forgot to mention before we move on to the next thing is uh, the moderator band, which is what that little piece of connecting myocardium is, and it has a Purkinje fiber or not, excuse me, not Purkinje fiber, a bundle branch that goes through it. Um, the moderator band's only present in the right ventricle. And one of the things it does is applies tension to this little portion of myocardium in preparation, oh no, in preparation for contraction. Because if you look at the wall of the right ventricle, it's thinner and less robust than the wall of the left. So the moderator band basically helps apply some tension here prior to contraction and even out the contractile force across the two, as well as preventing like overfilling and overstretching of the right ventricle. So that's what that's for. Okay, so that's our electrical steps and nodal system. So remember all of the little pink arrows that I'm gonna now fill in and draw are representing the spread of the impulse via gap junctions to the rest of the myocardium. And I'm gonna draw this little arrow bouncing off the fibrous skeleton because it can't go through there. And then let's draw the rest of the arrows just to sort of fully flesh out our drawing. And there you have it. That's the nodal system order and the muscular and contractile events that follow from it. So now I'm gonna delete all this and we're going to talk about the EKG waves. So let's label this as well at the top. Um, so EKG versus ECG, they mean the same thing. We use the K for the abbreviation, even though it is spelled electrocardiogram. Because ECG sounds a lot like EEG. And in medical communication, if you're having to yell for an EKG, 
and somebody mishears you and thinks you say ECG, then they're going to bring you a, a apparatus that measures brain electricity instead of heart. And that's not ideal. So um, we just go ahead and use the German abbreviation because it is audibly different from ECG. So that's, that's the deal. All right, one second. I'm gonna grab my tortoise because he's being loud. Okay. You can go burrow in the couch. There you go. All right, so electrocardiogram. So there's a couple different uh, kind of aspects of this that make it not the easiest conceptually for students to understand. And we're not going to go as deep into understanding it as you might uh, in medical school, nursing school, or in paramedic school, for example. So you might get the feeling that I'm glossing over some stuff. That's because I am, and it's because those things are just kind of beyond the scope of our class. So there's plenty of really excellent detailed explanations of the EKG interpretation um, and lead placement available elsewhere, but we're not gonna do much of that here. I am gonna briefly explain some stuff though. So one thing I wanna make clear is that Not trying to draw random lines. Trying to draw something on purpose and specific. There we go. So if you're in my class, up until now, you're used to seeing electrical changes plotted on a graph. And if you're not in my class and you're watching this from the future, hello, why are you here? What are you doing here? Um, so my class, we're used to seeing things like there's millivolts and milliseconds, and then some kind of thing that maybe looks like this, or maybe it looks like this, or maybe it looks like this, depending on what cell you're looking at, right? So it's important to remember that this chart is measuring the ion flux, so the movement of cations across the membrane. This is only measuring one cell. So in another Zoom, I explained how electrical recording of cells works using electrodes. So you have a reference electrode, and then the one that you either poke into the cell or you put on top of the cell, depending on what you're trying to measure. But regardless, it's still only one cell. So you're used to seeing that. And then when I start to show you the EKG, it throws students off because you're used to thinking of depolarization as being up. In this diagram. And then repolarization is down. But that's only true if you're paying attention to the electrical activity of one cell at a time. And that's not what an EKG does. What an EKG does is measures the ion flux and electrical changes across the entire heart and also from multiple angles. So I'll explain what I mean.
So here we have an anatomically incorrect heart. And I want to measure its electrical activity so I can estimate its health and get other information about it. But I don't want to do that by opening the thorax of my patient. So what is a clinician to do? Well, we know that the heart does electrical stuff. And then what's around the heart is wet. And then the surface of our skin due to sweat is also very faintly wet. So because the electrical events are the flux of ions and the flux of ions kind of reverberates through our entire body a little bit, at least enough that you can detect electrical changes in the heart by detecting their echo across the skin. So that's why you have those sticky leads. That means we don't have to tear open our patient and go look at their heart um, or measure its electricity directly. We can just stick stuff to them, which is a lot better. So with the leads, the, the classical sort of arrangement that you see is a 12 lead EKG. And the classical arrangement of waves that you see is essentially a result of a specific placement of leads. So there are other ways to place the leads, but regardless, they come in pairs. So what you get is a cathode and an anode. And those are things that measure electrical flow. So let's write that stuff down. So we'll be dealing with images that result from 12 lead ECG. Leads come in pairs, and the pairs include Okay, so this is a little bit confusing, but it's not that bad, I promise. So electric electrical measurements is measuring electron flow. And so the cathode is basically what's being flowed towards and the anode is what's being flowed away from by the electrons. So it's got pluses and minuses. So that's just to explain the basic underlying principle. I'm not going to do much more in the way of that. but that's the basic underlying sort of electrical stuff about it. But you need to know that they come in pairs and each pair has a plus and a minus. So so basically the way you place the pairs of electrodes, so I'm gonna say that these little pluses and minuses are my leads. If I place the cathode on one side of the heart and the anode on another, I can watch the ion flux between those two points by measuring their difference. And what I get is part of the wave tells me about that flow. So I can measure the electrical flux of the heart from through this angle and see to what extent electricity is flowing away from the plus and towards the minus. And then if I put some other leads in some other spots, yeah, like this one, for example, I can look at the heart through this angle. So if that's the left side, I might be able to get a view of what the left ventricle is doing through the heart 
through the body. And so then you just basically apply that to the placement of the rest of the leads. And again, you don't need to know specifically which leads measure which thing that's beyond the scope of our class. I'm just explaining to you how that chart is generated, which will help you understand why it's different from this one on the left. So pairs, and then we have six lead pairs that basically look at and through the heart from various angles. Which gives you the classical EKG wave, which I will now draw for you. Oh boy, it took a long time. Okay. So that is the classical result from a 12 lead EKG placement. And this is the one that you'll be looking at and interpreting for your test and in our book. Just making you aware there are others, but this is the one that you need to concern yourself with. So let's dissect the parts of this. So the waves are named and they have names like P, Q, R, S, and T, which is nice because you know if you know the alphabet, you can figure out which things mean which stuff. So the P wave corresponds to Atrial, so top of the heart. Depolarization. And that's nice because, you know, seeing a bump that goes up and recognizing that as depolarization is familiar because you're used to seeing up be depolarization. I'm just telling you that's not always true. So that's that. And then when it declines and goes back to a flat line, that means that the ion flux has moved on from the atria and we're not seeing activity there anymore. So the QRS complex, as you can see, is really tall. And that reflects the conduction of electricity through the ventricles during ventricular depolarization. And then the T corresponds to ventricular repolarization. So this is where the chart deviates from what you're used to because you might be saying, well, if, if P is depolarization, how can T be repolarization? And the answer is, we're not only measuring one cell, we're measuring the entire heart from multiple angles by looking through it using pairs of electrodes. So that's why it looks different and the rules, quote unquote, about what up and down mean do not hold in the same way that they would for a single cell recording. 
So I'm gonna add some stuff into this. And we're basically going to just look at it piece by piece. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out how I want to do this. Hmm. So some of these come in intervals and I'll just point out the intervals first before I apply time to it. I think that's the most appropriate thing. Um, so let's point that out. So you can see that after the P wave, it goes flat a little bit. And that means that the wave or impulse that generated atrial depolarization represented by the P wave has passed. So the PR interval is the distance in time between when the P begins and the beginning of the QRX complex. And so the reason that we look at that is to see how well the timing of the heart is functioning. So um, if you look at it on squares, it should be about three of the small squares. So between three and five. So it's, it's very small. It's about 0.12 or 0.2 seconds. And so, for example, if you were to see that that interval would be increasing, that would tell you that there's some problem that's preventing the impulse from traveling effectively through the internal pathway and down to the AV node, or preventing the uh, impulse from traveling through the bundle. So something would be wrong. So you can pay attention to intervals to see something, some information about how effectively the wave of depolarization is traveling. And then we also have the ST interval. So it's the short pause between full depolarization. I'm gonna put V for ventricular. So we can see atrial depolarization, ventricular depolarization, and ventricular repolarization. So an astute student will notice that something's missing, and that's the repolarization of the atria. So they have to repolarize, otherwise they can't reset to participate in the next cardiac cycle. So that begs the question, well, where are they in this picture? And the answer is, in this placement of the EKG leads, you would see it except for because the ventricles make up so much more of the myocardium, they're large, they have thick walls, they have more electrically excitable cells. The signal from the QRS complex swamps out and masks atrial repolarization. So it's not that the atria aren't repolarizing, it's just that you can't see it because the signal from the ventricles is so large. So all of this is happening on the order of about 0.8 seconds. Oh. 
But of course, depending on the heart rate of your patient, that might be more or less. So in a patient with tachycardia, for example, the R peaks are going to come closer together. Um, the reason you, it's, it's just easier to visually measure the distance between R waves than it is to measure the distance between where I wrote. Um, so it's just a, a way to eyeball a chart and quickly measure it. So essentially, you can eyeball how fast a patient's heart is going, is beating, by looking at the distance between R waves, and that will give you an estimate of heart rate. And then really it's about 0.8 seconds or 800 milliseconds on average. And that's how the majority of them will appear in your book and in other resources. So, Let's add in one more thing, and that is nodal stuff. So if I know that atrial depolarization is caused by the SA node, then I have to assume that the SA node is going to fire about there, and that will presage the depolarization that follows. And then same deal with the AV node. It's gonna happen somewhere in here to initiate this. And then we got the traveling of the wave down the interventricular septum and then back up through the Purkinje fibers. And so that's encompassed by all of this. Because of course, that's what causes the depolarization. All right. And that concludes the massive amount of information about electrical stuff in the heart in exhaustive detail. So I'm gonna stop the recording now.